Hello, everyone. I'm Evo Dalder, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review. Happy New Year to all of you joining us today. It is January 6th, our first show of the year, and it's good to be back. A lot of things to talk about in the news, but what we're going to do is take a look ahead and see what the big stories are in 2023. Here to join us in that conversation are Susan Glasser, who is staff writer for The New Yorker. Susan, great to have you back. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Great to be with you, Evo. Bobby Gosh, uh, opinion editor and uh, opinion uh, columnist at Bloomberg Opinion. Bobby, great to have you back and Happy New Year to you as well. Happy New Year to you and to everybody. And from London, Prashant Ra uh, Rao, now with uh, Semaphore, senior editor there and author of its flagship, literally, uh, newsletter uh, that comes out every morning. Prashant, great to have you back as well and Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. Thanks for having me. Uh, Susan, let's start with you. Uh, a, a, a ceasefire has uh, unilaterally uh, declared by uh, Vladimir Putin has gone supposedly into effect uh, in the Ukraine war. Clearly, 2023 is going to be uh, dominated, uh, at least in this, at the start, with that war, with Vladimir Putin's uh, desire to uh, to expand the Russian Empire and to become the next Peter the Great or maybe Vladimir the Great. Um, how do you see uh, the story unfolding in 2023 and what should we be looking for? Are we going to have an end to the war through peace, through victory or some other kind of way uh, in which to think about it or perhaps a change of regime in in, uh, in Russia? How do you how do you look at uh, at the coming year? Well, thank you so much, uh, Evo. It's, it is it is great to be with you. I've been in Washington all week for this first week of 2023, where we're having our own war of attrition up on Capitol Hill uh, with Kevin McCarthy. Uh, you know, uh, in some ways, he's doing faring even more poorly than uh, than Ukraine is uh, in its conflict with, with Russia. But, you know, look, the problem is, is that, uh, you know, we should stipulate by saying that almost a year into this awful war, nobody wins. Uh, you know, this is this has been uh, already the largest conflict in Europe since since the end of World War II. Uh, and uh, not only uh, does it show no signs of ending anytime soon, but uh, there are worrisome uh, indicators that suggest that you know uh, escalation is still possible. Uh, that Russia, as we've seen again and again and again, uh, when backed into a corner, when pressured, is actually when the prospect of additional war crimes and atrocities uh, uh, comes forward, when Russia has uh, reacted over the last few months by escalating its attacks on civilian populations far from the front lines, when, uh, when pressured successfully by Ukraine militarily. So, uh, you know, I think we begin the new year and we have to in it with a sense of really, you know, hard eyed, tempered realism about where things are. Ukraine has made a remarkable and it is remarkable stand against Russia. Uh, it's 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 bigger, wealthier, more populous, uh, more heavily armed neighbor. It is it is uh, a, a demonstration of national resolve and resilience such that we have not seen. However, uh, uh, Russia has thrown more and more uh, uh, personnel into the meat grinder, as it's called even by many Russians, uh, of its military. And there's a long history of uh, Russian military operations that suggests that they're undaunted uh, in many ways by the kinds of failures and catastrophic loss of life that would uh, cause many other great powers to think again uh, about a military operation like this. And so I took uh, with great notice what Vladimir Putin said in his traditional New Year's address to the country this year. Uh, uh, and I should say, having lived in Russia, New Year's is the big holiday there. The Soviet Union, the communists sought to get rid of Christmas and replace it with a secular holiday of New Year. So this is like, you know, uh, this is like our Christmas and New Year's and Thanksgiving all wrapped into one. It's a very big moment annually in Russian life. And you have the leader speaking to the people uh, 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 right at the stroke of midnight there as the tradition. Vladimir Putin did not uh, give his usual canned address from the Kremlin. 
Uh, notably this year, he flew to a Russian military um, base and had uh, uh, people in military uniforms uh, as the backdrop. Who were they? We don't really know. <laughs> Probably just his own security personnel. But, um, you know, it was a notably martial backdrop. And his language, again, it, it, it dispensed with the boilerplate of uh, this kind of address. And it spoke in very stark terms, preparing the Russian people for a long-term conflict, speaking about this as a, a war of survival for Russia itself, speaking about it as a war not with Ukraine, but with the West. Uh, and rather than being the war of aggression and imperial conquest that uh, we see, Vladimir Putin has consistently spoken of this, as has his state propaganda, uh, as a war of um, a defensive war in which somehow the West has forced them into this conflict and they have no choice but to continue it. And so I would just, you know, begin with that as the, as the framing, unfortunately, for a long conflict. Two other quick data points just from this first week of the new year. Number one, you saw uh, the catastrophic loss of life that followed that New Year's address. Uh, Russia consistently has been tactically, uh, you know, poorly organized and disastrous. Dozens, dozens of Russian uh, 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 military personnel killed. It could be more than 90 uh, uh, when uh, these recruits were stationed apparently uh, in the same building as uh, a large amount of munitions and boom, uh, you know, the Ukrainians got it and uh, you, you start the new year in Russia with a horrific loss of life. Number two, just uh, the other day here in Washington, uh, the United States announced billions more uh, in aid being released for Ukraine, including Bradley fighting vehicles, which they had resisted sending in the early phases of the war. And we see this pattern uh, repeating itself of weapons that were initially considered too potentially escalatory uh, for the United States to send to Ukraine. Then after a few months, uh, they go ahead and send them anyways, whether long range artillery, high Mars, Patriot missile battery is now on its way uh, to Ukraine. And so, you know, we'll see what it is. Does the new year continue that pattern of more and more sophisticated, long range weaponry uh, uh, making its way into the hands of the Ukrainians and possibly changing the military calculus on the ground? Uh, that's a sober uh, uh, picture uh, that uh, that you're painting here, uh, Su uh, Susan, and I, I I don't I think uh, disagree with any of it. Uh, uh, it. It does seem that um, if anything, escalation is more likely than than negotiation uh, in in the conflict, and and so the balancing act that I think the administration has been having to balance between doing what it can to support Ukraine without necessarily finding uh, itself uh in in a direct confrontation with uh with with Russia is is will be ongoing uh Prashant you uh you want you see it it it, it, it the same way and, and and if so what does that really mean for how we should be thinking about it because it seems to me the last 10 months of the war we have thought about it as something that will end relatively soon whether it was a negotiation or some victory or exhaustion or whatever. But from the moment the war started, we thought it was going to be over relatively soon. Is it necessary to start thinking about this, not in terms of weeks or even months, but potentially as years of conflict? And how do you then support the Ukrainians, limit Russia, um, and, and, and avoid escalation? Is, is Do we really need a, a different sort of gestalt uh, view of of this conflict that we've had from something that's temporary to something that's maybe part of of our future uh, or at least foreseeable future in terms of politics and strategy. I mean, I guess I would defer to you and Susan in particular, given your coverage and sort of time in, uh, in Brussels. I, my sense is 2024 is really the next kind of real, I, you know, kind of depressingly, I just assume uh, that this war will continue through the course of this year. Uh, and the 2024 is the next breaking point um, where, you know, Putin either gets removed by uh, Russian, you know, the, uh, by an inner circle or some other way, you know, uh, there's a sort of theoretically a Russian election that year, as well as the Ukrainian election. Uh, and so there are, there are pivot points then, but it just feels until then his incentive structure is guided towards aggression rather than negotiation, exactly as Susan put it. It doesn't feel like there are 
many reasons to believe that this will end anytime soon. I'm, I'm curious what you know the rest of you think, but it really feels like 2024 is the pivot point. And sadly, this war is likely to, going to continue through the course of this year. I think that's a wise, uh, you know, a lot of elections, U.S. election, Russian election, uh, um, uh, Ukrainian election uh, a, a, in 2024. And we'll talk about the big election in 2023 in a minute. Uh, and it may have some influence uh, on this war uh, in, 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 in ways. Uh, but Bobby, you know, if you think about the long term, uh, that really we're talking about next pivot point is 2024, not uh, for another 12, 15 months. Um, the implications of the continuation of the war, not only for the people of Ukraine, for the economy of Ukraine and, and, and Russia, but really for the global the global system uh, writ, writ large, uh, are significant. Uh, it, of course, there's the food and energy crises uh, that are affecting uh, much of the global South. And there is this you know this 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 battle of who aligns with whom uh, against whom uh, going on, and, and I wonder if you 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 see any, you know, again we've we, we've sort of approached the war as a temporary, really bad hiccup, but it would end, and if you assume it won't end, what then are the implications for an India for uh, uh, the global the global South more generally, and and of course for China. I think that's a very good way of framing it. Um, and I agree with Prashant that 2024 is the year to look out for. 2023 will, will probably be, sad to say, a very bloody year. There will be escalation and periods, I think, of, of uh, uh, de-escalation. But I, I can't, I don't see, absent a big black swan event coup in the Kremlin or some such thing. Um, that would be a white swan, perhaps, but... Well, yes. um, <laughs> no, um, but uh, but yes, I, I don't see the situation on the ground changing a great deal, uh, except, except to say that the more these sort of the new uh, waves of weapons arrive in, in uh, Ukraine, the more there will be escalation on the other side, because that's just how Putin rolls. Um, which means that now, if we, if if the, the the leadership of the West also agrees with us, and let's hope they do, that this is this is a long term thing, then we need to we need to act in 2023 as if this is going to continue into 2024. Then that sets a stage for a different kind of agenda. So, you know, a big part of it has to be, as you say. How do you prize away the the global south, uh, the portions of the global south that are supporting directly or indirectly the uh, the uh, the Russians, and how do you get the uh, the larger proportion of the global south, which is sitting on the fence, to get off the fence onto the what we would consider the right side of this conflict? And and I don't think a substantial effort has been made in that regard, not by the West beyond, you know, some bromides. Um, and also, interestingly, not even really by Zelensky um, and the Ukrainians. Um, they've been very, um, for extremely good reasons, they've been very busy communicating to the West because they need Western support. But I think Zelensky has missed a trick by failing to adequately communicate with the global south, with the particularly with the countries that have the the legacy of of colonization. He should be able to communicate with them in ways that resonate um, much more than you know something that Biden says or Macron says. Um, you know, Zelensky pressing home the point that this is a this is this is a war you. The former colonized states should be supporting because we're we're in the position that should be familiar to you. We're at the risk of being colonized. This is an imperial war against us. Um, that's a very powerful message and worth making. And I think Zelensky, as hard as it is, is going to have to put some time aside this year to make that to sort of make that point over and over and over again. It'll move the needle with some people. I'm fairly certain, certainly in Africa, uh, certainly in Latin America. I'm less certain it'll move the needle with Modi, for instance. Um, but it's an effort worth making. Um, and back to, backing Zelensky, the, the the Western powers would need to then offer uh, those countries that have been hesitant uh, economic incentives, diplomatic uh, incentives, 
to get off the fence or to at least pull away from Putin. That's going to be the sort of diplomatic slash geopolitical backdrop to the year, I think. Uh, very smart, uh, uh, Bobby. I think that's uh, that, that that that's exactly right. And and it, it, remember when the war broke out and the first discussion happened at the UN Security Council was the uh, the uh, UN uh, representative of Kenya who made that very strong anti-colonial message and the importance of borders in in a in a continent that had been drawn by colonial masters in many ways. And if you start questioning borders, you question uh, the order. And it was a very powerful statement. And coming back to that, and I think having Zelensky as, as an advocate for that makes makes sense. Uh, Susan, I want to come back for one minute to, to, to you on, on, on the U.S. side, because I the question I get most from non-Americans is how long is the United States going to be there? Uh, because it is, the, it is critical to the support we saw uh, just with the Bradley fighting vehicles that allowed the Germans or forced the Germans, however you want to put it, uh, to to do more themselves. Uh, the French helped in this uh, as well. Um, but without the United States, this thing doesn't work. So uh, it's a it's a legitimate question. And you're sitting in Washington, and if you know, forgetting for a moment the 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 spectacle that the country is is witnessing on Capitol Hill. More generally, how how do you think this is going to evolve in the rest of 2023? Well, thank you, Evo. Uh, and by the way, just to underscore, totally agree. I've been personally surprised that there hasn't been more effort to follow up that amazing speech uh, by the, the the UN the representative from Kenya with more of this. Uh, it is a remarkable thing that Russia has denied the literally the existence of Ukraine as a state, as an independent nation, uh, and yet Ukraine has not naturally acquired the sympathies, the support, and the backing of people uh, you would think countries that would be the most naturally sympathetic to that argument. I mean, you know, R Russia, uh, it shows that the desire to tweak the U.S. superpower remains a strong motivating force in international politics. Um, and then just quickly to, to this question of the assumptions about the war, because I think it goes to your question about how long is the U.S., you know, really going to be politically and militarily committed to the defense of Ukraine goes to the assumptions about the war itself. And I think to, to the extent that people thought it was just going to end quickly, that was wrong. That was never uh, a really a, a realistic assumption. We saw that Putin himself made that mistake catastrophically when he thought he could have a kind of lightning uh, decapitation strike on Ukraine's leadership at the beginning of the war on February 24th of 2022. But it's also, you know, Ukrainians, again, putting Ukraine rather than Russia at the center of our perspective, things look really different. Because for Ukrainians, uh, and I think it has to be now going forward for, for Washington, for Berlin, for Brussels, the war didn't start on February 24th. Uh, a horrific new phase of it started. The war started on 2014, which means that in 2024, we're entering the 10th year of this military conflict. And it has been 10 years almost since Russia illegally annexed uh, the Crimean Peninsula and uh, launched uh, a war of proxy militia forces in eastern Ukraine that was an actual conflict, an armed conflict, uh, not just a rhetorical one. And, I, you know, there are people in Ukraine who believe, I think, with, with a lot of solid grounding that had the United States and its partners done more uh, in the aftermath of the initial phase of this conflict in 2014, we wouldn't be long talking about the catastrophic disruption of this much more active phase of the war that Putin launched uh, in in just the last year. Uh, so I think that's important backdrop to the politics here because we've been getting it wrong again and again and again uh, in Washington, in Brussels, uh, and it's a screw up that's that's caused uh, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of lives, millions of people uh, losing their home, going without heat, uh, you know, in the middle of this winter. I mean, it's, it's just a terrible, terrible screw up. Uh, and we need to be humble about that, you know, in terms of the, the foreign policy consequences. As far as the politics right now, it's actually not disconnected entirely from the, the, the mess on Capitol Hill to the extent that there is 
uh, substantive disagreements among Republicans in the House that are causing this gridlock over who to, should be the next speaker. Uh, it's mostly about power and personal ambition more than it is about ideology. But there is one significant ideological rift uh, between this small group of Freedom Caucus holdouts and the larger House Republican conference, and that's Ukraine, and that's Russia. And it's not an accident that many of these House Freedom Caucus rebels who are refusing to go for uh, Kevin McCarthy as speaker are also uh, charter members of what you might call the pro-Putin, pro-Russia caucus uh, in, in the Republican Party. And it is a minority, uh, but as we've seen, it is a vocal, disruptive uh, and uh, uh, minority that has a significant amount of leverage at times and an amount of leverage disproportionate uh, to their actual numbers. So I don't see the coalition for supporting Ukraine uh, breaking up anytime soon, especially because re Democrats have remained extremely united uh, around the policy of uh, the White House and President Biden. And uh, I don't see that, you know, breaking ranks anytime soon. Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader, uh, is very strongly committed uh, to the support of Ukraine. In fact, McConnell is a main reason why even though Donald Trump uh, as president, uh, as we know, uh, didn't think much of Ukraine and wasn't very interested uh, in an independent Ukraine, uh, was constantly looking for ways to support Putin. Uh, but it was McConnell uh, and Republican senators on Capitol Hill who were really the bulwarks kind of, you know, constraining Trump and stopping him from going with his instincts. So uh, again, there are these tensions and fractures and fissures within the Republican Party. Uh, we'll see if 2023 is the year that they kind of break wide open or not. Uh, I suspect not. Uh, and that that coalition can be maintained for a while. But, um, you know, this is where we're also dealing with uh, a world where ground truth will matter too. And what happens in the war will affect what happens in Washington and Brussels and other Western capitals? We'll be watching it. It's a, it's a, a fascinating uh, and, and in many ways depressing uh, way to enter the enter the year. But uh, as you say, we've been when it comes to this war, we've been at it. At least the Ukraine's been at it since uh, since 2014, uh, and we're likely to not see anything changing until uh, until much later. Um, uh, let's uh, let's let's move on to sort of the second big uh, uh, issue, Bobby, that we wanted to discuss, which is the most important election in 2023. Uh, um, uh, you, uh, you 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 mentioned that when we were looking for topics, uh, people need to think about this one. Uh, what is this election? Why should we care? Well, there'll be some important elections next year, or rather, sorry, this year. Um, Nigeria will have the biggest election. It's the biggest. Uh, uh, democracy in uh, in Africa. Um, Pakistan might have the most contentious election, and certainly the loudest, noisiest. But um, I'm making the argument in a column appearing early next week uh, that the most important election of 2023 will be taking place in Turkey, where Recep Tayyip Erdogan will be standing for a chance to extend his rule over Turkey into a third decade. That'll come, I think, on the 18th of June. And because of who Erdogan is uh, and the kind and geopolitically in the axis uh, of world events, I think that is an election that'll have enormous impact outside of the country itself. Um, I think every important world leader will be paying close attention to it, including Putin, of course, Zelensky, uh, Biden, um, the entire NATO leadership. Um, in the West, I think in general, there will be a certain amount of hope that uh, Erdogan loses the election. Um, he is looking more vulnerable than he has in the previous 20 years, although I would not be quite so sanguine that he will be defeated. Um, there's also a question about what if he is defeated? Does that mean Turkey turns on a dime, 100 degree, 180 degrees, and returns to the fold from the cold um, as a uh, as a NATO ally um, in the in the bulwark against uh, Putin? I'm again not so sure. This is a man who has run that country for 20 years. He has ceded every institution in Turkey with people 
uh, of his choosing, people who view the world in the same radical way that he does. Um, and if he is succeeded by somebody else as president, that person will have their hands full trying to undo the legacy of Erdogan, which would probably take many, many years. But in any case, I think it's a crucial election. It, it intersects, it's at the intersection of all kinds of important uh, ge geopolitical uh, uh, things, including what happens in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the, the contest for um, uh, the rights to, to drill uh, for oil, what happens in the Black Sea, uh, and of course, what happens in, in Ukraine and what happens to the war there, the questions of what happens in, in Syria, the refugee uh, uh, sort of a crisis that's always hanging over the head of the Middle East and, uh, and Europe. Um, so for all those reasons and many more besides, I think Turkey in 2023 will hold the most important election. No, I think uh, 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 that is uh, certainly one we have to watch very closely. And, and Prashant, I think every the, the rest of the world is going to be watching it very closely. I think the uh, 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 clearly um, not only is the outcome of the election important, the conduct of the election, and, and whether it, it whether this is the, the the breaking point in democracy or, or not. And we see uh, attempts already to outlaw opposition parties. I gathered just today a decision by the. Um, uh, high court to uh, to cease the funding of the the largely Kurdish uh, uh, party in in uh, in politics and and the question of, of whether this election will actually be fair even if uh, uh, under uh, Erdogan may or may not win uh, is that what you know uh, should we think about those kinds of things as well as as well as the geopolitical uh, implication uh, the sort of the internal democracy implication as well as the geopolitical implication of this uh, of this election. I mean, in many ways, those two things are linked uh, and they sort of build on one another. You know, I think all of us have covered enough elections over the years to know that it's not the rigging on the day or anything that happens necessarily on the day that leads to a sort of um, uh, uh, an election that's been compromised, but the things that happen in the weeks and months ahead. Um, you know, the mayor of Istanbul, possibly the most credible challenger to Erdogan, is, you know, in theory, uh, well, could well be jailed or has been, you know, convicted of what he and others believe are politically motivated charges. You I wonder if we've we've lost uh, Prashant there. It, it affects all of us, and so um, you're you're yeah, back this, there, Prashant. Oh, uh, sorry, we lost we lost you for a minute. So uh, you, you were talking about uh, the mayor of Istanbul being jailed potentially. Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, we we know like all these things. I think like you know we see with Putin uh, as an example of what happens when democracy is compromised and too much power and and uh, sort of uh, decision making is concentrated in one individual uh, who you know could have very well likely might have very flawed judgment um, and an inability to correct those judgments leads to impacts not just for that leader's peoples, but people in neighboring countries, as Bobby correctly points out, refugees, uh, countries far away who have interests uh, with regards to Turkey or the Turkey effects. So these two issues, I don't think you can disentangle them from one another. Yeah, no, I think that uh, uh, that makes sense. And, and, and Susan, uh, uh, we haven't been able to disentangle them within our own policy towards uh, towards Erdogan in, in, in some ways, because on, on the one hand, uh, he, he is pursuing policies and and is uh, undermining democratic institutions uh, that are, are are clearly not finding a, a strong audience in Washington. And yet, on the other hand, he's the president of Turkey uh, and, and Turkey is is a strategic uh, vitally important part, and you can't go too far in opposing him, uh, particularly with the Ukraine war and and uh, a veto power at NATO. Is, he still needs to approve uh, Finland and Sweden coming into NATO. Uh, he has an incredible amount of leverage, and for any leader, particularly uh, the leaders in Washington, to have to deal with this country is um, is tough. Uh, and I wonder how uh, how you think Washington is going to react to the next six months. Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent point, Evo, is that I, you know, we've watched 
Uh, the last uh, several presidents struggle really with uh, with Erdogan in the course of his now very long rule. Uh, you know, Barack Obama sort of came in thinking, wow, this is a guy that I can deal with. Uh, at one point named him as his, his best interlocutor by the end of Obama's presidency. Of course, they were on, uh, you know, terrible, uh, you know, essentially non-speaking terms. Uh, Donald Trump, you know, again, fell for the trap of the, you know, the kind of dictator I can deal with. <laughs> he loved Erdogan. Uh, he called him the Sultan. Uh, and, uh, you know, according to Fiona Hill's memoir, he, um, uh, you know, he was the, the interlocutor, actually, that um, uh, Trump's aides and advisors on the National Security Council most worried about in some ways. They worried about him as much as what Trump might, you know, do or say on the phone with Vladimir Putin. Uh, and uh, we saw repeatedly uh, that that was a well-founded uh, fear because, in fact, it was after phone calls with Erdogan, where Trump, you know, appeared not to understand his brief and, you know, was like, fine, well, great, we'll pull out of Syria, you deal with it, uh, and, you know, caused all sorts of crises. And Joe Biden, by the way, has not been uh, immune to the very kind of hardball uh, tactics. It's not that, uh, you know, Turkey uh, is uh, rough as an adversary. I would say that Turkey is very rough as an ally. <laughs> uh, and uh, you saw Turkey basically holding up Biden, uh, uh, the Biden administration came in very sour uh, on Erdogan. They refused to have uh, any kind of a bilateral meeting, never mind an in-person uh, uh, discussion uh, between Biden and Erdogan. And that was the price that Turkey successfully extracted uh, to, uh, you know, get the ball rolling on uh, Swedish and Finnish accession. But that's still not done. Uh, and to your point, I think that, you know, he will milk every last uh, bit of leverage out of it. The other X factor for me, uh, Bobby, and I'm curious, you know, looking uh, not only at, you know, your upcoming column, but just, you know, going down the road, what your thoughts are about the politics for Erdogan domestically and as he is pressed by opposition, as he's reaching sort of this Brezhnev era of tenure. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of exhaustion with him inside of Turkey. Uh, how does that affect um you know, him as an international and geopolitical actor, you know, do you feel that as he's under more pressure uh, in an election year calculus, uh, you know, will that make him even more intransigent? Uh, what does it mean in terms of his relationship with Putin and Russia? Uh, he's always uh, a potential double dealer, it seems to me. Uh, and I say that uh, only uh, not out of some character assessment, but because we've seen that so frequently from Erdogan in the course of the last 20 years. I, I agree. I think here in the West, there is a tendency to think that Erdogan is just misbehaving, he's being a spoiled brat, but that he can somehow be brought back into line. That, that you know, we have this perception of what Turkey is and ought to be in the Western calculus of the world. Um, and surely, surely a rational leader of Turkey must agree and must behave uh, along those lines. And I think that is a fundamental misunderstanding of who Erdogan is. He has a very, very radical worldview. This is not, I mean, yes, a lot of what he does is transactional, but his philosophy, his underlying political belief is shot through with this radical, his view of Turkey's role in the world and, and in Europe and its environments is not to complement uh, the Western uh, agenda, but to set a separate one and to replace the West in uh, that part of the world, in, in, in the Middle East, in Central Asia, in Eastern Europe, in a very wide and very important swath of the world. That's not going to change no matter what. And and I think the, the the sooner the policymakers in Washington, in Brussels, in in Paris, in Berlin, and in London, the sooner people come to recognize this. And God knows we've had time enough to 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 learn. Uh, but the sooner we learn what animates him, what motivates him, the better. Um, I don't, I mean, the domestic politics right now is very fraught. The economy is in an absolute shambles. And in every poll, Turks say their country is going the wrong way. There's also, of course, after 20 years of Erdogan, there's a certain amount of fatigue. Um, but 
his poll numbers are not as bad as they should be and and have in fact in the last few months crept up a little bit he's back up to the 40% mark which is astonishing considering how badly he has run the country in the last 5 or 6 years and he's counting on a few things if the if the saudis and the U- and the uh, emiratis and the russians pour enough money into that economy this spring the, 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 the we might get a facsimile at least of an economic bounce and that might just do enough to give uh, uh turks to 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 persuade turks to give him another chance there's also the question of whether the opposition can remain united whether they can put up the right candidate against him right now the the candidate that's most likely kirishtarolu of the chp is this very bland very uh, sort of the the very opposite of Erdogan. Uh, in fact, he's propo- he's projecting himself that as a virtue that he has. He's completely colorless, has no charisma whatsoever, and uh, but it's hard to win elections with that kind of of uh, a personality. Um, so. I won't rule out the possibility that either he wins the presidency again or if he loses the AK party retains majority in parliament which means that whoever is the new president will have a highly disruptive uh, parliament I mean we think that our our politics is is dysfunctional uh, boy the turkish politics might just get a lot worse than that just what you'd want for a country, right? Wishing them uh, our our congressional politics on their country. Uh, it's uh, it's not not a great uh, uh, not a great thing to look forward to. Uh, Prashant, uh, last uh, but certainly not least, uh, one leader who doesn't seem to care about what the dysfunctionality in his politics is Xi Jinping. Uh, but boy, he's uh, he's facing some really big challenges in coming in 2023. I guess a year ago. Uh, we thought he was riding high. He certainly thought he was riding high. Uh, he was able to uh, to get uh, appointed uh, really president for life, but uh, things are not moving in the right direction inside China. And it's not just the end of zero COVID, but uh, it seems that a lot of other issues are, are coming to, uh, to a head here. Uh, so um, how do you see 2023 evolve and and uh, and in particular, what do you think? Uh, uh, um, how is she, how is she going to get out of this this box um, that he uh, seems to have created for himself? I think the thing that always clouds us when we talk about China is, you know, we. I mean, just people. I think in general are are sort of biased towards decision points, things that happen that we can hold on to and that may change our thinking. And that's why China is so hard to read because things change and they change over years, right? There's like, you know. I recall a New York Times uh, piece by a tech reporter who went back after three years and discovered that nobody uses cash anymore. And Chinese society just is is changing in ways that we don't fully understand and cannot grasp, partly because of the continual lockdowns and the lack of a sort of Western press corps that's only beginning to be rebuilt. Um, and so I, I think a lot about, you know, all of the various ways. So, you know, it's very easy to think right now that Xi Jinping is is, is on uh, is on a low swing. But actually, if you read, you know, economic analysts, they fully expect that the Chinese economy will begin to bounce back from the second quarter or the third quarter of this uh, of this year onwards. And so, it may well be that this is, you know, the kind of thing that had to happen eventually. And so, you know, China's taking its medicine now. It's very, I think, cogent to argue that it's doing so very poorly. It planned for this extremely badly. Um, but when I think about China in twenty twenty three, I think about sort of three things. Um, and, you know, journalistically, it's very nice they kind of have a bit of alliteration. Um, I think about COVID and how uh, China pulls out um, of uh, zero COVID, uh, particularly, you know, with this enormous unvaccinated elderly population, the strain it'll put on its healthcare service. It's, you know, reminded all of us who uh, think about China a lot, but also, you know, informed a lot of people how poor China's social safety net is for its people. Um, and uh, I think about climate. Um, and all the various ways in which China giveth and the China taketh away when it comes to uh, c- um, climate, whether it's with its enormous wind farm construction um, or its uh, sort of dominance of the battery sector and, um, and and solar panels, or you know its continual really fast paced construction of coal plants, um, and then I think a lot about chips uh, because. Um, I think the you know there's a fantastic piece in Politico uh, a couple weeks ago about how in fact Joe Biden has uh, conducted a much more powerful trade war on China than 
Donald Trump ever did by his astonishing um, restrictions on semiconductors. I just do not think it is possible to overstate the extent of what the White House has done to the Chinese semiconductor system. You know, the report in Bloomberg uh, a month ago about a woman who smuggled in semiconductors in a uh, uh, sort of uh, pretending to be pregnant. Um, Chinese China semi China is effectively having to abandon. Um, uh, it's massive uh, spending on building up its semiconductor industry. Uh, this, it's just, I, I just do not think it is possible to fully grasp the extent of what uh, the Biden presidency has done um, because it is so all encompassing. Uh, semiconductors are just the most important thing in the global economy right now. Um, uh, and I, I just think, you know, that the restrictions that they have placed on them and the way in which they are reconfiguring the global economy. Uh, by forcing all manner of companies to diversify their supply chains, to diversify away from China, um, is the kind of thing we will not fully grasp for years to come, because this is the kind of thing that is not sort of built around a press conference. It's not built around a single decision. It's built around millions of little decisions made by countless businesses, big and small, from Apple to, you know, your kind of the, the company I'm most fascinated by is this Dutch company, ASML, which is maybe the most important company in the world that manufactures semiconductor fabs. Um, and the Biden presidency has been desperately trying for the Netherlands to restrict um, trade with China. Um, it's just all of these things that we just don't realize happen in our world. And that is the classic China story. It, it, it dominates and it is everywhere, but we often don't fully grasp it because it is everywhere. Yeah, I think that those were three uh, uh, three important pieces to look at, and I think the chip, the chip uh, uh, story is going to be playing out for for a long time. I uh, I think we will look back and to to contradict you on decision points, we will look back on October seventh, which was the executive the date of the executive order on semiconductors, uh, as the pivot, as the thing that really fundamentally changed uh, things. Even though we don't really understand how it's going to do, because it's going to take time to uh, to look at it. But if, if this works, and I, I think the White House is actually quite confident, for example, that they got not only the Japanese uh, fabrication company, but also this Dutch company, ASML, uh, to to play ball, uh, it's 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 going to be a tremendous impact on on an aging society that uh, uh, that was hoping to leap ahead and in some ways is leaping ahead when it comes to uh, uh, digital cash, uh, batteries, EVs, uh, et cetera, Tesla is, is, is losing market share to, uh, uh, uh to Twitter, no, <laughs> losing market share to, uh, to Chinese, uh, EVs, et cetera. So it's a, a fascinating place. Um, uh, Susan, I want to give you one, a point on, on China, if you want, uh, uh, just to, to sort of, what do you think from Washington's perspective, what are they going to look at beyond, are these the three things? And, and, and if so, um, uh, what is going to have uh, the, the sort of the attention of the White House? Yeah, I mean, those are obviously right on the mark. And I'm certainly curious to see, uh, you know, just how big the, the scale is going to be from this COVID wave uh, in China that they've sought for so long to prevent. And now, uh, you know, it seems to be happening. And of course, there's the, the Lunar New Year celebrations coming up. I believe they start, uh, you know, this Saturday and, and run for a long time. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, what is the scale of uh, uh, the kind of coming out of zero COVID mean uh, in real terms. And I, cause I think that that, uh, you know, there is a spectrum here. And if you go up to the worst case scenario, I think it has a direct impact on the kind of decisions uh, that we'll end up seeing from Xi Jinping. I'm also interested that, you know, the one word I didn't hear was Taiwan uh, in in that listing of priorities ahead. And the reason I flag it, I, it's it's not my expertise, but I would say that here in Washington, uh, it is a preoccupation border, bordering on an obsession. And, uh, you know, the question of, you know, further provocative moves uh, by China in terms of, you know, disrupting a very tenuous and not sustainable status quo. We just saw that a few days ago, you know, that, that the, you know, the, our new year began, uh, you know, with China, uh, uh, you know, making a very big military show of force. And, um, you know, in Washington, security questions today still remain quite 
divorced from economic considerations. I agree that uh, you've seen this National Security Council and, you know, we've all heard it directly, you know, from Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor. He's almost obsessed, uh, you know, with uh, correctly with this issue of uh, what you might call a new industrial policy and especially the security implications on uh, uh, not only chips, but other national security related consequences of um, uh, uh, globalization that hadn't been paid enough attention in, in the previous uh, iteration of this administration, which really was the Obama administration. And so um, more integrated than in the past, but still the bottom line is our security, national security conversation is a very different one than our economic conversation here in Washington generally. And I think that you know, the, the national security world is very, very focused on increasing urgency that they see uh, uh, to the t- Taiwan question. So I just flagged that. And and by the way, you could call a cross-strait relation, so it fits in the alliteration of the of the four <laughs> cities to, uh, to, to get it back in there. Bobby. Um, no. Well, you know, Prashant masterfully summarized the, 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 the year ahead for China. Um, but if I could sort of echo what we were saying earlier in the conversation about Russia and Ukraine, how the global south perceives China is also going to be very interesting this year because um, the early part of COVID, you know, if we remember the, the the message out of China was that China had this authoritarian advantage, that that China's system was worth emulating and uh, by the rest of the, certainly by the global south, um, because it was evidently so superior to the Western system. The Western systems were, were struggling to cope with, with COVID, whereas China seemed to be gliding quite smoothly through it. Well, that that has come under severe uh, uh, challenge now. And 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 the the basic fundamental absence of um, of governance, of of the ability of of sort of governing skills of institutions um has now been exposed and and china will need to find a way to cover up those cracks in, in its dealings with the global south and and to try and explain that away the 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 sort of super confident china uh that we saw strutting across uh much of asia africa and latin america um will it'll be hard to pull off that that uh, elan um in in quite the same way and i think to Susan's point about Taiwan, that too will be something the global South will be watching. It's it's hard enough to 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 hold the line with Putin on Ukraine. It's going to be very hard for the global South to bear uh, more Chinese uh, sort of another war, uh, Chinese aggression in Taiwan. The impact on the economies of the world, impact on particularly the the, um, the developing world. Boy, that doesn't bear thinking about. Yeah, no, I think uh, uh, well, uh, well put. A really important uh, piece, and you know, if 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 models are right, and a million plus people die in the next two three months, hard to make the case that they did a better job of dealing with uh, than say democratic Taiwan uh, with uh, on COVID. Another sort of uh, point there. Um, we're almost out of time, but I want to I wanted to uh, give uh, ask each of you, starting with you, Susan. Uh, uh, what's the what's the story in 2023 that um, that you think uh, uh, we ought to be paying attention to, but really aren't? What's the as, as Rumsfeld would put it? What's the unknown unknown for 2023? <laughs> well, maybe I'll, I'll throw a known unknown out there, uh, uh, you know, which is to say it's at the backdrop of many of the stories we're talking about, uh, the role of technology, disruptive new technologies uh, and changing geopolitics. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the sort of killer drone, kamikaze drone warfare uh, in, in Ukraine that we're seeing by by Russia uh, and, and also by the Ukrainians on a mass scale before. That's the future of war. What's the next twist in that. Uh, uh, look at um, uh, the role of artificial intelligence in particular, not only in this conflict, uh, but I think in rewriting uh, many of our assumptions about how the world works and uh, not only the future of work, but uh, the future of everything. And that includes international relations. It includes warfare. Uh, and and frankly, uh, you know, dystopia here is uh, as likely or more likely than utopia as a result. Uh, Prashant, what uh, what story are you? Do you think we're going to be looking back at, at the end of twenty twenty three that we may have missed at the beginning? Um, I think 
I, I worry a lot about the levels of debt that is piling up, particularly outside of the kind of quote unquote rich world. Um, and particularly as you know, the Fed raises rates and the dollar strengthens. I think a lot of vulnerable economies are in a really sort of difficult situation, and you know that doesn't just affect them, but. One, I think um, sort of richer countries have less financial capacity in a post-pandemic world and in a, Ukraine, a, a world where they're supporting Ukraine to forgive debt and to restructure it. Um, I also think there's a situation of, you know, if, what is the phrase? Uh, if you owe the bank $100, uh, you know, it's your problem. If you if you owe the bank a million dollars, it's the bank's problem. Um, as as these debts pile up, this, this becomes a bit more of a problem. You know, I think... Um, Africa's own debt load has uh, doubled in the last 10 years, uh, and its debt service costs have increased by 35% just this year um, as compared to last year. These are really big economic problems that won't just say in the economic world we saw in the pandemic that actually like not having the financial resiliency to withstand a massive shock will have huge implications around the world. And so that's something I, I worry about a lot, particularly if, as the Fed says, rates will stay at the, at the rates they are for this year. Um, this is not going to be a short term problem. Uh, I think that's a, 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 a sound warning for all of us to pay, pay attention to. We're not doing enough on that uh, for sure. Bobby. Well, so much of last year was consumed in in war. So much of our, our discussions was consumed in war, Ukraine, uh, in particular. Um, this year, I'm watching two potentially post-war scenarios in Yemen and in Ethiopia, both places where civil wars are currently in in sort of in frozen in truces and ceasefires, how those are negotiated, how the how those countries move forward, if they move forward, will be very instructive, will be very important, not just for those countries. Remember, both Ukraine, both uh, Yemen and um and Ethiopia far bloodier in terms of lives lost than uh, than Ukraine. Uh, so it'll be very in instructive to see how they try to resolve the yet unsolved political uh, uh, problems that led to those civil wars, uh, and what the rest of the world can do to help. Because that it, it might be worth thinking of that as a sort of test case or as a, as a sort of uh, a petri dish for what we have to do in Ukraine in the eventuality that that war ends. Um, so those are the, the the two areas of the world I'll be paying very, very close attention to. And to Susan's point, I'll also be worrying, Evo, that before the end of the year, you will replace all of us with some video version of chat GPT for your future Chicago Council discussions. Yeah, or, or the other way around. You will be there, but we'll have a video version of me, uh, for sure. Uh, 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 but I, I like, Bobby, we have an optimistic, potentially optimistic part to look forward to. Not everything in the world is bad. Uh, some, uh, Hopefully some are good. Uh, we went a little longer than normal, but I thought it was uh, important to uh, to get all of these issues. Really appreciate uh, a really brilliant uh, uh, conversation here uh, today and, and your insights. Uh, Bobby Gosh. Uh, Prashant Rao and Susan Glasser. Thanks so much for joining us and thank you all for joining us. We'll be back next week with another edition of uh, World Review. And until then, have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.